the Lie derivative. So in this video, we're going to have a look at uh, the general expression for the Lie derivative and what it tells us about a given tensor quantity. Now the Lie derivative evaluates the change in a given tensor quantity as it moves along the flow of some other vector field. So we'll begin with a manifold on which some vector field u of x is defined. The integral curves of this vector field are given by x of lambda mu, such that at all points they have a tangent vector given by dxi d lambda is u of x. These integral curves form a congruence, so that means that each point on the manifold has only one curve passing through it. And so our manifold looks like this, with the congruence curves on them, congruence lines. You can see them here, mu, mu plus d mu, lambda, lambda plus d lambda. And these red uh, arrows here, they represent the tangent vector ui. Then we're going to define a curve c with parameterization xi of lambda and tangent vector ui is dxi d lambda. So here's our curve C that we're interested in, one of a number of the congruence curves. Here's our curve C, and we're just picking this particular curve here. And on this curve, we're going to have two points, point P, point Q, point P at the value x, and point Q at the value of x plus dx. So they're infinitesimally separated from each other, but on the same congruence curve. Then we're going to have another vector field V, which is defined in the region of C, the curve C. You can see the diagram below. And we're interested in how this vector V changes as it moves along the curve C. That's what we're aiming to look at. How does it change as it goes from point P to point Q along this curve C, along this congruence curve? So let's have a look. It turns out we can represent what is happening to the vector v at the point q in terms of its value at point p, and that's, that's what we want to try and show now. And we can do this with an infinitesimal coordinate transformation, where we go from the point p to the point q, so from x to x plus dx, and we're going to do this in the form of a coordinate transformation. And we're going to call this x plus dx x prime, so x prime is x plus dx. And we can write this last bit here as x plus u, the tangent vector, d lambda. Because if you remember, u was dx d lambda times d lambda, which just gives us dx. Now, when we're dealing with tensors, so a tensor of rank 1, a vector, which is what a vector is, a tensor transformation law requires that from the unprimed to the primed coordinates, or from the, or the vector, the unprimed vector to the primed vector, we must follow this transformation law for a tensor. Ten, all tensors of rank 1 follow this transformation law. This transformation here is dxi dxj plus dui dxj d lambda times vj. Right now these are independent coordinates, so the Kronecker delta applies here, delta ij. More compact notation for this derivative here, this, this partial derivative of u with respect to xj can be just written like that d lambda times vj. Now, when j is equal to i, multiplying this and the Kronecker delta together and remembering that when j is equal to i, this becomes vi of x plus all of this times vj d lambda. Right. Now the point x prime, x plus dx, so this it equals x plus ui d lambda, represents the point q on the curve. So we can write the value of the vector v at the point q is its value at point P plus this term here.
but the value of the vector v at q can also be written as vi at q is vi of x plus dx is approximately equal to this object here. Again, at x, point p, evaluate at the point p. And we did this, if you think back to our high school calculus, we remember that f of x plus dx is approximately equal to f of x plus f prime of x dx for small dx, which is what we're dealing with the infinitesimal quantity. So this first order approximation means that this can be substituted with this. And so in the case of this vector here, we can substitute it with this expression here. So that's how we've approximated v at q. Now what we want to do is compare v prime with v at the point q to see how the vector v has changed as it's moved from point p to point q. So here's a picture again. Here's our vector v at point p. Here it is at point q. It's moved along the congruence curve here. How has it changed? That's what we're interested in doing. So the lead derivative of the vector v along the curve c is given by the lead derivative of the vector v with respect to the vector field u is the limit d lambda approaches zero v of q minus v prime of q on d lambda. And when we substituted in the two expressions we found earlier, we said these leading terms here and here cancel out. And then the d lambdas divide out and we're left with this expression here involving some partial derivatives. Now, because they're all evaluated at the one point P on the manifold, we could just as easily write the same expression, or just as correctly write it in this form here, using the covariant derivative, on the understanding that the Christoffel symbols are going to cancel out because we're talking about the same point P in both cases. So the Christoffel symbols of those points will cancel out, and the end result is that this expression here just becomes this one. So they're, they're both equivalent at a single point P only. So here, here we are again. The lead derivative of V with respect to the vector field U is this object here. And we've evaluated the change in V, the vector V, at the point Q here by using its value at the point P. It's almost as though the manifold has been slipped, the point P, the whole manifold has been just been slipped along the congruence curve to the point Q so that we can evaluate the change. Or, Another way of saying it is the manifold of point Q is being slipped back to the point P. And you'll see references to this in textbooks, and that's all they mean. We're evaluating the change in V using its value at the point P. Now, if the lead derivative of V with respect to the vector field U is zero, then we say that V has been lead transported, um, a similar sort of process to um, parallel transport. Uh, which is in another video. Right, the lead derivative of a scalar function f, which is a tensor of rank 0, is just this object here, a covariant form like this. <clears throat> right, what about a tensor of rank 2, a mixed tensor of rank 2? How can we find its lead derivative? Well, first we need the tensor transformation law as it applies to a mixed tensor of rank 2, and that's this object here. You can check here, primed, i, up the top, J down the bottom here, primed, where you take from the unprimed to the primed uh, coordinates. And moving on, so our first coordinate transformation is x prime is xi plus ui d lambda, divide through by dxk. Here we go on the left and the right here, sorry, we get dxk through all independent coordinates, so chronica delta applies here, delta rk plus this derivative here. And our next coordinate transformation is, because we need a second one now, if you remember, there's two of them, because it's a rank 2 tensor, so x prime is xl plus ul d lambda. We can rearrange that to get the unprimed bit in terms of the primed minus ul d lambda, and we'll see how that applies shortly. So our, this transformation leads to dxl dx prime j is dxl prime dxj prime minus this object here. Coming down to the next line, we can split this object here on the next line using the chain rule. So dxl, dxk times dxk, dx prime j, d lambda. These two increments here would cancel out. So we split this object here using the chain rule. 
And this object here, the reason we did that is it gives us another transformation. We have a look here, it gives us this bit in the bracket here. Similar to this here, this is another transformation here. So we put that in there. Okay, now independent coordinates here, so Kronecker delta applies there. Uh, this derivative, just more compact notation this way. Do lambda, and again Kronecker delta applies here. All right, minus this business here. All right, now we can expand out the brackets. We get here the Kronecker delta. This uh, here, Kronecker delta times this object here gives us this, plus an order, plus terms involving uh, the order d lambda squared. Now, d lambda is an infinitesimally small quantity, and when we square it, we get an even smaller quantity, a much smaller quantity. So we can ignore second order terms that are second order in d lambda. And that's so it's approximately true to say that we have this Kronecker delta here. But we simply keep the first two terms, these two terms here, and here we go down here. And that's this second last line is approximately equal to this last line because this term is incredibly small. Negligible. Negligible. All right, so at the point Q, we have the following form for this uh, second rank mixed tensor, mixed rank uh, tensor of rank 2. Here it is. Here's a tensor transformation law for a mixed tensor of rank 2. Write out the two terms we found. All right, times that. Multiply them out. Well, there's some Kronecker deltas here. Uh, if you have a look here, when um, uh, L is equal to J, these two L's here will disappear and we'll get J down here. And when uh, K, these two K's here are equal to I, they'll disappear and we'll get this I here. All right. And then uh, we have these, that term and that term. And then this last term here, which is of order d lambda squared again. So we, we, we can reasonably ignore that because uh, it's very, very, very close to zero. And we're left with the first three terms. So when we evaluate the Kronecker delta, the two k's here, and they're equal to i, we get the i here. Um, and over here, uh, the, the two l's there, when j is equal to l, we get the j down here. So we get this for a second rank tensor, a mixed tensor of rank 2, we get this expression here for the transformation. Now, on the other hand, we can approximate this second rank tensor of Q in this form here. So here we go to first order. We can approximate this rank 2 tensor here, like that. Gives us this object here. Uh, again, just a reminder from high school uh, calculus where how that comes about. Now we need to calculate the difference between the, ten the prime tensor at Q and the unprimed tensor and see what happens. So the lead derivative of our second rank mixed tensor is given by the lead derivative of the tensor with respect to the vector field U is the limit d lambda approaches zero of this object minus that one on d lambda. Put the, the terms in. All right. And so this leading term here cancels out with this leading term here. And then there's d lambda terms cancel, they divide out. And we're left with these three terms here. Now again, because we're talking about the single point P, the uh, Christoffel symbols will vanish at that one point because they're all evaluated at the same point, so they should all be the same. They cancel out and we're left with the covariant form, we use the covariant derivative on each of these, and we get the lead derivative of the mixed tensor of rank 2 with respect to the vector field U as this object here. Finally, the general form of the lead derivative for a tensor of any rank is given by this object here. So have a look through here, follow these, and follow the general pattern. You can see what happens. It just takes a little bit of time to look at it and follow it through. But you should be able to do that for a tensor of any rank. And that's the lead derivative.